Okay. Uh, hello. This is lots of people. Um, yeah, the WordPress REST API. Um, so now I have everybody here from my very clickbaity title. Uh, I'm going to exploit that. Um, so typically when you know you write a talk, then you try and keep things simple and have a few themes that you reiterate and do that. And that is completely the opposite of what I have done for this talk. So it is a bit of a train moving through. Um, and hopefully, it will somehow end at the right point uh, at the end of this hour session. I um, should also say like we're going to have like a couple of minutes intermission in the middle if anybody wants to leave or come in from our sessions. Um, so there's a, yeah, a good amount to get through here. So let's go. And uh, it's probably worth bearing in mind, but if they like code concepts and things that I have, it's quite uh, pseudo code. So it's not all copy pasteable. It's more about the ideas and things like that. So obligatory first slide, what is an API? Um, we probably all know what an API is. Uh, here's me using the REST API console to make some requests to the WordPress REST API to uh, show you how that works. So we can request some posts. We can add some parameters to change the data that is returned from those endpoints. That's pretty much how it works. Uh, I don't think we need to kind of go into a lot of detail there. The more important question is probably why uh, a REST API, uh, especially when we're talking about trying to get this merged into core. This is quite an important question. Um, so having a REST API just allows us to open up WordPress uh, in a programmable way to every other platform language uh, system out there. So we can just uh, make WordPress as part of lots of other things rather than it being a little siloed thing. That's pretty much how I think about it anyway. The REST API doesn't really do anything on its own. It's just a mechanism of which to interact and kind of bootstrap that. So here's a quick uh, demo of me making an HTTP request on the command line uh, to list some posts. Uh, so you can see I get my posts, and then I can also search for something, get a little post with world, and I can pipe that into JQ and list the titles of those posts, and I can also uh, get those posts URLs in the API, and then I can use that in turn to send delete requests to those posts to delete everything with the word world in it, um, and then uh, just go to the admin to verify that it's done. So that's quite a simple program that I made there just on the command line, but you can see that you can open up WordPress to this world of possibility where you can use it for a lot of different things. So the kind of uh, format that I want to go is a journey through the REST API in time to uh, kind of outlay the kind of different decisions and features that have been built along the way. And hopefully within that, you'll be able to get all of the concepts, uh, et cetera. So it started, how long ago is this? Three and a half years ago. So uh, yeah, it's been a pretty long project, founded by Ryan McHugh uh, as a gist over Christmas, because I guess that's what Ryan does at Christmas. Uh, so January 2nd, this 590 line patch uh, lands on GitHub. And uh, forward another six months, because that's how Ryan works. Uh, he decides to make it a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, so that will enable him to work over the summer on this idea that he has for core to have a WordPress REST API sponsored by uh, the Google Summer of Code project. So primarily, uh, Ryan and uh, Rachel Baker work together on uh, building out what is kind of dubbed version one of the REST API, and that is uh, released version one stable one whole year later. Uh, so that's a lot of work that kind of went into that version one um, and was used to a pretty large degree as well. It uh, allowed access to the core WordPress uh, data types. It was read and write. Uh, and broadly speaking, it's a very good API, but having uh, several problems in terms of its goal of getting into WordPress core, um, but was utilized a lot for uh, plugins and things like that for a custom development. Um, so to try and um, address some of those shortcomings, though it was a, a solid API, I think it was just missing some uh, key things that were going to be required for WordPress inclusion. Um, had no real internal API for registering routes and uh, things like that. So 
I guess, uh, something akin to register post type or something. Before that, you could still register post types in WordPress. You just had to filter things, et cetera. That's uh, kind of how version one of the API worked. Um, it was also a little tricky to extend. Most of the endpoints had just been written uh, for purpose for doing the thing that they had done rather than being reusable blocks of code. So it was a little more tightly coupled uh, and, and more difficult to do because of that. Um, so we decided, I guess, this is when I got involved with the project along with Daniel Bachhuber uh, to do version two of the REST API to kind of uh, have a, a run over again, I suppose, at, um, you know, see if we could get something that was more appropriate for core inclusion was the primary kind of focus on that. Uh, so this is where I decided to get involved and probably the date that I remember the best for the biggest regret of uh, the last several years. Um, so the, uh, the first thing that we focused on uh, in version two, or one of the first things, was the idea of there being a metadata level on top of the API, often referred to as schemas, which is a pro programmatic way to read the API and interact with it at a more automated fashion, rather than there needing to be completely custom implementations for this specific WordPress REST API. Um, so you're probably wondering what the heck that means. It's a little abstract, so I'll kind of give a quick demo here. I make a get request. Uh, to a post, and when I do that in the API, I get a response for the post object. Um, the post object has a little more data than this, but you kind of get the idea. If I send an options request to the same URL with the REST API, I get this big JSON schema blob telling me what all of these different fields mean, um, so I can use this for uh, things like documentation, um, and uh, you know things like that. And as you can see, there's like a one-to-one -one pairing typically between the properties and then a programmatically readable description uh, and definition of what that field is. Um, like I said, this can be used for documentation, which is kind of handy. You can also use it to build uh, automatic UI in clients. So maybe um, if it's a custom post type that isn't a recognized data format, you could have a client that is automatically rendering different fields based off of the automatic description of those. So for example, take the status field. Uh, we can say what that is in a description. We can say it's of type string, but we can also say it only can have these valid values. So if you were building some automatic UI, maybe you could just have those options from a select down list or something like that. So it's just this extra meta layer on top of the kind of a core API to be able to use it for um, some, some more automation. This was a fairly controversial decision at the time. I think it was probably about two months of pretty heated discussion between uh, several people in Google Hangouts and things. And that's a bit of a theme in the API, especially for those kind of like eight months there where there was uh, just a lot of um, heated debate, we'll call it. Um, so anyway, around eight months of hard work, um, tears, more for me. Um, lots of talking and discussion. We finally release uh, beta one of the API. Um, I think Ryan had quit the project about four times within this uh, period. Uh, we'd met up, I think, a few times in person. Um, and you'll see later on that beta one was just the beginning, though we probably thought we were pretty close at the time, as people often do in software development. Uh, so what did beta one include? So this is the beginning of everything that we introduced. Is It's pretty simple, so I'm just going to kind of quickly run through what, what that is. Um, there is a class called WP REST controller, which is meant to be extended for different uh, object types in WordPress. So you would have a posts REST controller, or a terms one, or a user one. Uh, so that looks something like this. Um, so in this example, we're going to use uh, the post controller that extends the rest controller and then it implements a method for getting a post and updating a post and deleting a post through the API. And that's pretty much how the abstraction works from a writing code perspective in the API. As well as the rest controller, we have a WP REST server, which is pretty basic. That just like groups up all of the endpoints that are in core and uh, routes like specific requests to the correct endpoint. We have a WP request object that just stores the data about the request coming in from the client with the data that it may have sent and some headers that it may have sent. That's very basic. Then we have a WP rest response, which is exactly the same for the data that is sent out. 
and that is really the whole of the REST API in uh, four classes. It's a slight oversimplification, I'll admit, um, but that's really the high level uh, concepts that you kind of need to get around. So let's just quickly look at an example request, see how that flow is through WordPress to get the code running for an API endpoint, et cetera. So the first thing that we have to do is register our route uh, or route if you're from England. Um, and we register that with a namespace and the uh, endpoint. We give it a callback for the function that will be called when that route is hit, and we say what methods it's for. So again, probably don't copy paste this code and expect everything to work off the bat, but you should kind of get the idea from this. Um, so the kind of flow of how we're going to get that code to run kind of works something like this. A request comes into WordPress. There's a rewrite rule for wp-json slash star. All of the uh, API requests are then sent into this WPRS server class that knows about all of the different endpoints. Because of that, it can route that request to the specific endpoint that you've registered based off of the URL. From there, it will call your callback in your, that you specified in the register rest root function. Um, and then your callback is going to get given that WP request, uh, WP rest request object. Return some data. In this case, it's probably going to be an array of posts. It's going to pass those back to the rest server. The rest server is going to JSON encode it for the client, and then it's going to send it to the browser. So that's pretty much how all of the requests work. All of the custom code that you're writing as part of the API is that little bit along the bottom of your different callback for, for that being passed a request object that is specific. Another kind of conceptual thing to get our heads around that's quite important with the API is how linking works, um, or how as it's kind of the spec that we uh, conform to is, is uh, identified. So going back to our usual get request for posts, uh, we send a get request to the post URL, we get the post object back. Like I said earlier, it doesn't quite just include that information. There's this special underscore links key as part of that object. And what this is going to do for us is show us links in the API to other related objects to do with that post. Um, the idea being you know, that that could be uh, the comments, which is the discussion one, the featured image for the post, the post parent, the categories, or, or something like that. Um, so the idea is then you can take that URL and you can do an extra get request for it and get that data that you want. So it's, it's just a way to cross-link everything like you would in links in HTML in a standard way in the REST API. So we released beta 2 in May. Uh, one month later, we're moving pretty quick. Things are going pretty well. Um, some notable improvements. One is that the REST API is now loaded before the main WP query, which speeds it up by about 40% or something. Um, for uh, anybody that kind of has run into that problem before, um, we also had this quite cool new uh, function called a register REST field, which allows plugin developers and uh, anybody else writing custom code to tack on extra data in the REST API response object. So when a post is going to get returned from the REST API, you may have a plugin that has added a price field to the post type of post. So you want to have that available through the API. Uh, so this allows you to uh, kind of hook up all of that stuff if you want to change existing objects. We also add pagination headers when you get a list of posts. So you'll get the XWP total and XWP total pages header. So when you do a request to you know, get 10 posts, you know whether there's going to be more available, how many more, and you can build your pagination links from those and things. Quite useful for theming and things like that. Um, we also have this handy thing where if you go to the root of the REST API, which is just wp-json, you'll see you get this huge amount of data outputted, which is kind of like uh, metadata about the API itself, telling you what all the routes are available. Um, and you can kind of do a lot of auto discovery and things from that. And I think uh, Cadden White has a talk this afternoon where he, uh, his client library actually takes advantage of this. So that's kind of interesting. Um, going back to this schema idea, which is probably seeming like a lot of effort for not a huge amount of gain. It's kind of a documentation kind of thing at this point. We try and kind of incorporate this uh, metadata 
that meta level of schema in the API into the functionality of the API. So what that means is when you define a schema for the object type that maybe your custom post type uses or a plugin is creating a completely custom endpoint, the API will be able to use that schema to validate and sanitize data coming into the API automatically. So if you say that this is a number, then it can automatically run it through inval or absint or something like that. Uh, so it's kind of trying to um, provide a good carrot for using schema, which leads into more documentation as well, rather than just hoping developers will uh, kind of get on board with that kind of stuff. Another very important component, um, you can now use show in REST when registering taxonomies and custom post types, and those custom post types and taxonomies will automatically be available through the REST API. Uh, so I'm sure most people here have used a lot of uh, custom post types and taxonomies, and it's pretty easy to get at least a basic uh, availability of those through the um, REST API. And you can either just go with the defaults that it gives you here. You can write custom controllers for your own post types if you want to do very custom stuff. You can use register REST field if you just want to tweak the uh, data on, on your custom post type a little bit. So opening up those is going to one, allow other people that use the REST API on your site to take advantage of that, but it also makes building stuff on your own site from the front end or something else very easy if you're already using uh, WordPress object types underneath. Two months later, we released beta 3, then we released beta 4, one month later again. Um, the main thing that's in beta 4 is the JavaScript uh, kind of SDK API. Uh, is updated for version two. Uh, shout out to Adam for putting a lot of work in there. It's a backbone, uh, backbone backed uh, JavaScript library that makes it really easy to interact with the, uh, the REST API. So again, it kind of puts this API into the global WP uh, JavaScript object, and you can quite easily just uh, be authenticated with the cookies and everything and make requests really easy from the front end of your site or from the admin if you're doing the kind of single page application in your admin kind of thing. Um, also, if you remember earlier, we have these links, this kind of this HAL thing that is um, embedded into the object's response. Um, so when we look at the uh, Post response, again, we have this links array, and it's telling us all the related things. You can do a fancy little thing in the API, which is add this underscore embed flag at the end of the URL. And as you can see, we get this underscore embedded uh, magic key in the uh, API response. It's going to load in all of those links and make requests to those kind of all at once. So the whole response that we get has all of the stuff that we're probably likely to need for that post. Uh, it can be handy if you're wanting to show the featured image alongside your post title. You don't need to make an HTTP request, or you want to show the author information or something, because that's technically a separate, separate object in the API. So after a huge amount of work at this point, everybody's uh, trying to get this thing into core. It's, well, I think, uh, the WordPress 4.4 uh, cycle. And finally, woohoo! we get the uh, infrastructure merged into core, which we think is the biggest thing ever. Um, this is the commit. I think it only failed trunk three times or something, so <laughs> good one, Brian, for that. These are all the people that contributed to the REST API on GitHub. Um, this was a pretty, pretty big moment, I guess, for us as a team, having worked on this for, uh, what is this, October, so uh, over a year. Um, so what did that actually do? Pretty much these four things is what got merged into the REST API, uh, into WordPress core. So we have the REST request and response, which are quite basic, the REST server, which handles routing for all endpoints, and this register REST route that allows you to add custom endpoints. As you can see, there's a pretty glaring omission there of actually any of the kind of posts and endpoints and things like that. Uh, so the kind of idea was to merge the uh, underlying infrastructure that allows you to create an API into WordPress, but actually hold off on the specific endpoints for WordPress objects that we'd created, and that was kind of the line between, which typically worked pretty well. Um, so we kind of diligently continue working, hoping to get these endpoints pushed forward, because the next step for us, at least, is to get those into core. Um, 
So a month later, we released beta 6 of the API. Now it doesn't have the infrastructure in. There's lots of breakage going on at this point because different versions of WordPress don't have the infrastructure merged. Uh, lots of lessons learned. So we released two betas in that month. Um, December, we also launched two betas. Things are still breaking. Um, the main thing that kind of changes in beta 9 is taxonomies are now just available at the root uh, of the v2 namespace. So you can get all of your custom taxonomies there as well when they're registered, which is their name by default. Um, we also have to change how all of the term stuff works in our endpoints because there was this thing that happened in WordPress core that I'm sure most people know about where term splitting happens and uh, the term ID and TTID are uh, now the same, so we were changed to using term ID. So we're like, the theme is we're having to kind of move with core as we're going here, because this project is spanning such a large amount of time um, that we're kind of uh, reacting to things as they change. And uh, that's still kind of ongoing today. We also ignore sticky posts by default from the API. Uh, sticky posts don't make much sense in an API kind of driven thing. It's more of a presentational thing. So sticky posts are available in the API, it's just they don't always show the top. And it took us quite a while, I guess, to find that because who uses sticky posts? Um, so right back to it after Christmas, uh, beat 10 arrives. Um, there's kind of just lots of bug fixes and things like that uh, kind of changing at this point. We kind of, as you can see from the dots along the bottom, they're getting very frequent, but not much kind of happening in between, which is kind of a good sign actually for uh, a project is you're not having as much churn and things like that. However, there are still some conceptual problems that we still haven't solved at this point. Um, so to the dismay of uh, many people, we remove post meta and other types of meta from the API entirely. Uh, so why did we do that? Um, good question. Uh, the problem with meta is it's very arbitrary. It's meant to be arbitrary. It's any kind of data that you want to attach to a post. And arbitrary data doesn't work so well in a structured API. So trying to match these two things together is a little tricky. Um, the data types of meta can be switched. So if you have a meta field technically in the database, that could be stored as any type of data that you want. Um, so for now, until it's solved, then we decided to remove it. But while that was happening, there is a core task, uh, or I don't know if you would call it a project or not, for introducing or bulking out the register meta function a lot to define a lot of the data. So as developers, whenever you're adding post meta, you can call register meta and tell WordPress essentially lots of stuff about this metadata, what type it is, and how it should be worked in the API. When somebody wants to update that field through the API, what should happen? So um, I think uh, Jeremy Felt is the one that kicked that off, and there's a few people working on it now. And Hopefully, once uh, register meta is resolved, then uh, we can bring the endpoints back into the REST API, and we'll be able to continue there. Um, but until that happens, then that's kind of on ice. Uh, and, um, you can still use as a developer things like register rest field to tack on those extra data that you want, so it's not a kind of big loss. This is for more arbitrary meta keys that are, you're allowing people to create and things like that. So in March, beta 13, as I said, these beta numbers are kind of getting up there where, um, I mean, you know, there's no extent to the amount we can go to, so it's not like we're going to run out or anything. But uh, the main thing that, uh, that we add here is queries to the responses. Um, so these fancy underscore links things, whenever you want to use a custom relation, because this is a standard, you have to use this unique uh, URI, ideally. So that's how an attachment relation would look, which is kind of annoying to read and work with in JavaScript and things like that. So queries just allow you to compress that down into a custom namespace that you define somewhere else. So when you get links through the API, you should expect the custom ones to look like this. So on to my favorite topic, <laughs> authentication. This is often an ignored aspect of the API, both one, because we didn't have great solutions, and two, because a lot of people uh, 
I guess. Authentication is kind of tricky, and it's just like, uh, I'll just wait until I need it and then go look at it. But I'm trying to shed as much light on this as possible, because I think it's a really key part of the API, um, and one that has been very under-discussed. Um, so I switched focus after beta 13 uh, onto authentication, and myself and Ryan uh, McHugh kind of um, tackle this problem a little more head on, which I'll kind of get into in a bit. So we have right now really four types of authentication with the API depending on your use case. And it is a very much use case based thing. It's uh, very dependent based off of what you're doing from where, based off of, you know what kind of uh, authentication you're gonna need to use if you wanna do things like uh, update post in the APR or update your custom endpoints or delete things and things like that. Anything that's not just publicly viewable already. So the first one we have is cookie based, um, which is if you're using, uh, you know, you have your website and you have a front end theme or single page application and you want those requests to be authenticated, you can just have people log in at your normal WordPress form and then they'll have their login cookies and you can send those to the API and those will work for you. Um, the best way to use that is the JavaScript backbone client, probably, because there's also an extra nonce that you need to use in your uh, request, and the backbone client will automatically handle that for you. Um, so the next one is basic auth. I'm sure most people know that. It's where, like, often you get that htaccess drop down. That's basic auth. Um, it's very insecure. It's very old, uh, but it's very convenient. So for that reason, we kind of recommend using it for testing purposes. There's a plugin you install which adds basic auth to your site. Um, but it's not that secure, but it works something like this. I'll show you anyway. Uh, you can just make a curl request. Most clients support passing basic auth username and password. So that's one reason why it's insecure, is you're typing in your password somewhere that isn't the WordPress login form. Uh, another reason is if your site is on HTTP, this is going to be sent in plain text so anybody can look at your password, and then they can do anything they want on your site if you use admin and password. Though, to be honest, if your username is admin and your password is password, people can probably already do that. Um, so on to OAuth 1. This is kind of the uh, proper way to do complex authentication type of stuff. Uh, to preempt the questions at the end of a section, uh, OAuth 2 is not really possible um, because it has a requirement on HTTPS because it handles off the uh, signing of requests to the HTTPS layer. Uh, so if your site has HTTPS, then that is okay. Uh, but the problem is we're kind of trying to have uh, solutions appropriate that are able to be used across all WordPress sites. Um, and when you want to build an app to talk to all WordPress sites, then you really need to be using the lowest common uh, technology available. Uh, so we're going to have to use OAuth 1, which is a little more complex, but there are uh, a lot of libraries available for you to do that. So using OAuth 1 with the REST API looks something like this. Uh, you install the REST API OAuth 1.0 plugin. may not be called exactly that. Just search on the directory. On your site, um, you then create an app in your WordPress dashboard for, uh, you know, similar to as you would as a Facebook, um, you know, if you create a custom Facebook app, you go to a Facebook developer console and create an app and it gives you some secret keys. This is that, but it's in your WordPress dashboard instead. And then you take those secret and client key that it gives you and you continue with the normal OAuth flow with those keys. So how does OAuth actually work uh, is a question I asked myself about three months ago. Um, so the uh, basic concept is you have the app that you're building, which may be a mobile client, it may be a website hosted on a different domain, it may be a server somewhere, whatever it is. Um, so the initial step is for the app to make a request to the site to say, can I please have a request token? Um, the site responds with that token back to uh, the site and then the site sends the user in a redirect over to their site where you get the little modal which says this site wants to access your whatever, whatever, do you want to allow it? A little bit like the Facebook permissions dialogue. So the user does that, they're then sent back to your app 
with this little uh, exchange token, basically. And it's, it takes that uh, token and it exchanges it through the API with another request for an access token. You can see there's lots of back and forth. I won't really go into the specifics of why this is required, but it's basically because neither party can really verify uh, whether the other one is who they say they are because we're doing everything over HTTP. So the access token is sent back to the app. Then in your app, you would typically store that access token against that user. So let's say you're doing WordPress to WordPress to communication. You could store that access token in a user meta key. Maybe you want to encrypt that first or something, but I'm kind of not going to go into that here. And then you can make authentic authenticated requests with that authorized token to the API, and you're going to have all of the permissions of the user that approved that token. A little cumbersome. Go to oauth1.wpapi.org. I think that is a still valid place with good information on kind of getting more details on how this works. So that's kind of not the most fun process, but there are client libraries available that help you a lot with this. If you're using JavaScript, there are plenty on NPM. If you're using PHP, of course, there are plenty available. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. You just need to understand the flow to you know, know what you need at what part. So the next kind of final part, I think, for authentication, I consider this currently at least to be the, uh, the thing that has finally solved our authentication problems in WordPress being such a distributed system. So there's two primary po problems, even with using the OAuth1 thing uh, that I just showed you. One is you've got to log into your WordPress site, and you've got to add the app and get your secrets ahead of time. So you can put them into your app so it can then do the OAuth1 process. And that isn't scalable if you want to make a photo app that is going to post to anybody's WordPress site, because that app isn't going to exist on all of those sites. Um, and it also doesn't solve the problem of if one app does get used by millions of people across lots of WordPress sites, and somebody hacks that app, app's database and gets all of those access tokens, they now have access to everybody's site. So how do you stop and revoke access from that specific app? We can't really do all of these things in everything that we described so far, and that is where brokered authentication comes in. So this was kind of a, a um, idea of uh, Ryan's, I think, several months ago. And a couple of months I was, ago, I was in Australia, so we decided to kind of work on this for a few weekends. Um, this is typically how it works, is Ryan gets me to work for him somehow on every project that we do. Uh, so how does this whole broker authentication work? So this is kind of the example of how you can do it right now. You can go to apps.wpapi.org, um, and that is where the authentication broker lives. So. You can create a new application similar to you would, as you would on Facebook or something. You give it a name, a description, and a callback URL, which is part of that OAuth1 process, which is where the user is going to get sent once they've said, yes, I agree, this site can have access. So you create that, and then once that is done, you will be given your uh, client key and secret to be used with the broker. So no uh, specific sites are involved at this point. This is just you as a developer creating an app. So usually we have the app and we have the WordPress site, but now we're going to have this broker that's sitting somewhere in between to help facilitate all of this bootstrapping process to not have you go in and create apps on everybody's site ahead of time, which is just uh, quite literally impossible. Um, so step one of this is for the app to send a request to the authentication broker with its client and secret stuff that you got on the previous page. The broker will then, once it receives that, go and contact the specific WordPress site that you asked that you wanted to get access to. The WordPress site right now will need the broker client plugin installed on it. Uh, my idea is for that to be part of core one day, but that is in no way uh, a sound possibility at this point, probably. Uh, so the site creates the OAuth1 app and returns its own client and secret to the broker. The broker then sends those on to the app. And it's worth mentioning at this point that no access has still been granted to the WordPress site itself. So the broker doesn't have a backdoor access into that WordPress site. All it's doing is being trusted for all of those developers that are creating their own apps. And the WordPress site is just kind of offloading that responsibility to the broker. 
So then the app gets its own client and secret that it can do the normal OAuth 1 process directly with that WordPress site. Probably seems very convoluted and complicated. It is a real thing. Brian even wrote a spec document for it, which looks very official. Um, so if you really like reading that kind of uh, verbiage, then I'd make sure to check out uh, absolutelypapi.org slash spec. There's also a page on there for app developers, which will maybe say what I've just said, but in a slightly more concise, coherent fashion. It's all open source. The site that is running on apps.api.org is completely open sourcing. Uh, the theme that runs it, the plugins, the whole repository is open source there. But um, as you're probably wondering, this seems like a very centralized kind of system, which is quite the antithesis of what WordPress attempts to be, and it's very decentralized, uh, not much phoning home, not much data sharing kind of fashion. So the broker is actually built to be able to be run in multiple silos if you want to. So the one that is running at apps.wpapi.org is just like the one that we have put up to be available. But if you are a very large organization, you could run your own broker if you wanted to whitelist applications that can be installed or have your own database of applications that could be installed. So it's kind of meant from the ground up to still be uh, make it so you're not having this you don't have to have this centralized place where you're allowing uh, people to come through to register applications. So that's pretty much the REST API in its entirety. I know that probably if you didn't know before exactly how to write an API endpoint, you probably still don't, can't open up your text editor and do that right now. Um, but you weren't going to remember that anyway, I think. So. Really, this is all of the key areas and concepts to do with the whole REST API. There's the PHP API, which is these four classes. There's two functions, really, that you need to worry about. And there's this idea of links, and then the embedding that is built on top of that to pull those links into those objects. On the JavaScript side, we have uh, the client library for Backbone bundled in the REST API. There are other client libraries available in JavaScript. I think there are. There's a Go one. Uh, there is a PHP one, I think. Uh, Google is your friend. Um, and then the authentication that you can use, we pretty much have four options. It would be nice uh, you know, if people wrote more authentication add-ons for things like OAuth 2 is still a valid plugin to exist, but we don't have one right now. Um, so to kind of show a lot of this stuff in action, let's kind of go through some examples and maybe deconstruct just a little bit how they're actually working. So uh, recently, the Guggenheim re-released their website completely built on the WordPress REST API. Works something like this, like most websites do. You go to the URL and you wait some time on your bad connection for it to load, and then the page loads. As you can see at the bottom, it's showing like the API requests coming in in real time as I'm clicking around the site. So uh, they have some custom endpoints here. You can see by the namespace Guggenheim, they're also requesting some of the um, post objects and things like that for their archives. Uh, so they're probably, anyway, not using any authentication because it's all public information. You don't need you know, anything fancy there. Um, there's a few other uh, kind of high profile examples of using the REST API in this kind of way. Us2 is one of those, the makers of Monument Valley, use a React.js uh, front end. Modern Tribe recently released their website as a decoupled, I think, React front end with the REST API back end. Uh, NPM uses uh, the REST API to power some of their page builder modules, again, in a read-only fashion. So kind of stepping up to the next level that people are using the REST API at, I have to admit, this one is one of mine, so uh, disclaimer. Uh, so there's the kind of like single page applications uh, approach to using it. You're typically going to want to use authentication at this point, but we're using cookie authentication on Nomad Base. So a user logs in the normal process, so then when they go to Nomad Base, you can see all of the API endpoints on Nomad Base are completely custom because Nomad Base is a very uh, non WordPress like app, I guess you could say. It's essentially visualizing remote workers moving around the world in fairly real time. Um, so all of the APIs custom there are using uh, cookie authentication. 
Another example close to my heart is uh, Happy Tables, which is another product that I'm somewhat involved with, or used to be. Uh, again, this is another single page application that is actually put onto tablets and distributed to restaurants uh, that is using the WordPress REST API uh, in a very non-traditional WordPress way, again. The next uh, example is, or would be, a, uh, a mobile app for WordPress that was using the REST API. Um, as far as I know, this doesn't actually exist. The WordPress mobile apps that you download from the store are uh, using, I think, both XMRPC and then the WordPress.com uh, API. So like every great uh, or unfortunate developer, I decided to build my own. Um, so introducing Vienna, appropriately named, uh, editor for WordPress. Uh, this is a real thing, this isn't a joke, but um, it's very early stages. So let's kind of look how that works. Got a fancy demo, I think. If I press play, oh, skip the whole demo. Either, either auto plays or I need to press space and then it'll start playing. There we go. Okay, so this is a React Native uh, iOS app, which is using the REST API and the broker authentication. So when I add a new site, I just all I have to do as the user is type in the URL of the site. So I'm just going to use the demo site that we have set up with some dummy data on WPAPI.org. When I click Add Site, you see it connects to the auth broker there. It then gets the request token and bootstraps all of this process. It then sends the user to go to their site to allow Vienna to access their data, and then it adds it to the app, and there it is. You can see you can go into the app, you can view all of the data to do with it, you can view custom post types, though I don't have any registered on this site. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and you can manage the data. Also supports custom taxonomies and things like that, uh, so you can edit those. So this is, um, oh yeah, has pull to refresh. Um, this is pretty early stages of just like a project that I threw together. Um, it is open source on GitHub, if anybody wants to look. It's, as far as I know, the only open source project that is using the uh, broker authentication for reference. So if anybody doesn't know, React Native is a completely native app, but it's built in JavaScript. It's quite, uh, I won't go into the details of that right now, but the point is the broker authentication is all just built using JavaScript, so you can use that uh, for reference if you want to. Um, so I need to update the README with instructions for building and things like that, um, but uh, it's kind of, React Native is something that I've personally been doing a fair bit of, so I thought that um, I have a couple of weeks, why not? So moving into the future of the REST API, uh, how does that look? We're at beta 13 right now. The plan is to release uh, the stable version of that version two plugin and call it uh, quote done, um, which obviously it isn't, but you know, you have to call it somewhere. Um, and that will allow that to be a stable piece of software that is gonna have forwards compatibility, backwards compatibility, whatever. Um, so people can uh, kind of consider themselves running production uh, code at that point. Um, but that doesn't include a lot of things still, and we're kind of aware of that. It doesn't include things like this, which uh, are plugins, themes, widgets, options, or settings. Um, there's still all of these things to work on, which are tangentially, tangentially related to the API or conceptually difficult. So there's still a lot to do, um, as well as kind of the version two of what we're calling those endpoints. So of course, we want people to contribute. Please, <laughs> how do you do that? You go to github.com slash WPAPI, WPAPI. You can join the uh, WordPress Slack account thing and join the Core REST API channel for that. You can also email ryan at armaq.io <laughs> and ask him anything you want. So the REST API isn't actually just uh, Ryan and then Rachel and then Daniel and then me. It's a lot of other people as well. Uh, so this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is the people that I personally interact with that helped out a lot on a lot of the REST API stuff. And this, this is my talk, then I get to arbitrarily call out names that I can remember. Um, so there's a lot, of, um, a lot of work to be done. The kind of like core team of the four of us are starting to get very 
uh, exhausted at this point. Ryan's been working on this project for something like three and a half years. Uh, so we're really trying to uh, get as much help as we can from as many parties as possible to be able to share a little bit of the burden if we ever hope to call the REST API done. That is me. I'm Joe Hoyle, at Joe Hoyle on Twitter. Thank you.